Welcome back to Project Kira. This is a collaborative speculative biology project that all takes place on the Project Kira Discord server. Last time, we took a look at the small but diverse clades of the false fused body creatures that stem from Oceanus falsus vermissa. Today, we will be looking at the last two major clades of Primuscira that were birthed during this time of rapid diversification. We start with the Vermissa. This is a clade that, unlike the true and false fused bodies, has stayed segmented to some degree throughout the entirety of their existence. The father of this clade is Ambulatia Vermissa, or Walking Worm. They reside in the shallow regions of the ocean crawling along the sandy seabed. Their bodies have formed an exoskeleton-like covering to protect their soft internal organs. The three front pairs of limbs have developed into primitive crawling-like appendages while adapting the fourth limb pair into a pair of gonopods or limbs used in reproduction or egg laying. They have taken a curled position almost resembling a tail. They feed on almost anything which lays buried in the sand mostly being small plankton. For better feeding, they have developed strange string-like whiskers that they use for shifting through the sand. Next comes a very basal member of this family tree. Their exoskeletons, in comparison to the rest of the vermissa clade, are soft and rather easy to break. Instead of developing a harder shell, they developed an alternative way to keep themselves safe from predators. Their limbs and tail would specialize changing to allow these creatures to dig out burrows in the sand. The legs act as primary digging tools while the tail is used as a shovel to push the dug up sediment out of their developing burrows. It is in these burrows that which they will spend nearly their entire lives, only ever leaving if the burrow is compromised or when finding a mate. They capture food using their elongated purple colored tendril antenna. By leaving these tendrils out in the open, they capture any small aquatic organisms or plankton which could float by. Their bodies are rather small in comparison to their relative clades, but this is preferred given their lifestyle. I will dub these creatures Nakivi vermissa or burrowing worm. But what if these burrowing worms gave up that lifestyle for something greater? If that were to happen, then you'd get the burrowing worm's descendants, vermisquilla or worm shrimp. Their exoskeletons have become larger and bulkier, with their bodies being much wider than their ancestors. Although their limbs are more advanced, they can still barely commit a slow crawl while in the water. The tendrils which extended from their faces have also grown larger, now acting in a similar way to the antenna of insects on Earth. Other defense mechanisms would have to be implemented to ensure the survival against predators. This key to their survival came in the form of better armor, introducing the one and only Prefixa vermissa, or spiked worms. This is a very prevalent group of vermissa found everywhere, from the deepest sea floors to the coastal shallows. Their body movement has slowed down considerably, even compared to their relatives who, in comparison to earth arthropods, aren't very fast. However, they have traded speed in exchange for better armor and defenses. Most groups of this clade have developed thick, long spikes on top of their exoskeleton shells. Groups who reside in the deep oceans look more akin to massive earth isopods. They mostly feed off of purple algae and sea plants growing on rocks and in aquatic sediments. More rapid change would befall this lineage as the descendants of prefixive vermissa became much smaller. Their main manipulators now act as feeding appendages to help grasp and handle food. They, like other vermissa clades, are bottom feeders and scavengers. Some records even indicate that they will even consume each other or their own eggs if the surrounding area lacks the appropriate food sources. Speaking of reproduction, these vermissa reproduce sexually, laying their eggs in the shallows of beaches which will later hatch and return to the deeper parts of the ocean. I will name these vermissa Cancer vermissa crabworm thanks to their similar behaviors. With plenty of seafloor scavengers, a new niche has been made available. A group of vermissa squilla saw this and took their shot, becoming some of the largest vermissa to exist in these early oceans, Gigantus vermissa, 
or a giant worm. These large creatures have grown in size similar to Earth's extinct Eurypterids. Despite their large sizes, they are deceptively fast, at least in comparison to their relatives. They are primarily carnivores whose main form of attack is to pin down their prey and let their mouths do the rest. Their back leg grippers and tail have become much more flexible and are capable of pinning down prey in front of them, similar to the tails and stingers of earth scorpions. Meanwhile, the tendril antennae act as heavy weights, holding their victims down. They are capable of biting and ripping off pieces of their prey due to muscular exoskeleton spikes around the mouth. When reproducing, males and females will dance with their brightly colored tendrils, moving them to and fro. After this, they will mate and be on their way. Despite all these adaptations, the clade itself is rather small, with only a dozen species occupying it. A descendant of Gigantus vermissa, this clade of Kira worms has, like many around the appearance of Purpura foliama, adapted for an ambush predator niche. To avoid the habitats that have already been claimed by Insidiae dracoa and Armatus ficticea, this clade of worms have gone to the forests of Purpura foliama, which, until this point, has not been explored. They adapted their antennae to look more like the purple leaves around them and also lengthened, changing colors to better camouflage with the purple foliage. These physical changes have allowed for a change in hunting strategies. With their tails buried beneath the sandy floor, they lie in wait for the right moment to strike, using their large pincer tails to kill their unsuspecting prey. These worms will be called abscondentum vermissa, or hidden worm. Don't let yourself be fooled into thinking that all the worms are seafloor scavengers. Meet Pinna vermissa, or fin worm. This is a descendant of Ambulotea vermissa. For going a lifestyle on the bottom of the ocean, they have adapted to swim through the open waters. Their front and back limb pairs have flattened into small paddle-like fins, pushing themselves slowly through the water. Their middle pairs of limbs have become much broader, becoming fins that are used to control their pitch and yaw, steering them in their desired direction. The back gripping limbs that were once used in reproduction have also become flatter, taking on a shape that is not too dissimilar to that of earth dolphins. This tail helps in avoidance of predators by providing a boost of speed. Females are rather simple in color, with males in comparison being much more colorful, coming in a variety of purples and blues during mating season. Males will fight each other by crashing into their opponents as violently as possible. The survivors of these violent interactions will win the right to mate with the awaiting females. Pinna vermissa's main diet is that of aquatic vegetation, with its ideal choice of food being the abundant purple stalks that make up their homes. This adaptation then can be taken to its obvious next step, full-blown wing-like fins. With the fins fusing, they become tougher to better push water. The limbs that were once used in reproduction fuse into a single morphological unit, being similar to that of the tail paddles of earth lobsters. While this may make them extremely proficient at swimming in the open oceans, they are unable to swim in the shallows. I'll call these aliens a lattice pinna vermissa, or winged finned worm. Coming from a lattice pinna vermissa, this clade of aliens has the honor to be the first creatures to become airborne. And while it is incapable of true powered flight, it does make for an interesting fact that the life on Kira 30 became airborne before ever making landfall. To achieve this feat, the armor became lighter with even small pockets of hollowness residing in the armor. While in flight, they fully extend their wing-like limbs and tuck their feeding antennae close to the body. They use this innovation as a defense mechanism, specifically to escape and avoid predators. The worms themselves are herbivores, feeding on the upper leaves of purpura stipula, and while this is still a very basic flight that has been achieved, it goes to show the amazing potential of life on Cure 30. These worms will be called Volans vermissa, or flying worm. With such an abundance of marine life, the need to be self-sufficient is not as great as it once was. In fact, 
Why do something yourself when you can have others do it for you? This is a clade of very distant vermissa who get their name from various clades who specialize in parasitism. We start this parasitic journey with a parasite behaving worm that latches onto small Piscis peninatora, waiting to be eaten by an Oceanus falsus vermissa. Once eaten, it rips out of the stomach and after many months, eats the inside muscles and meat from inside the ocean false worm. In stage two, it secretes a chemical from its body and reforms the structural shell of its host, morphing it into its adult body through metamorphosis. Near the end of this stage, the fins on the outside all fall off and the shell begins to crack. As soon as it breaks out, the creature will set out on a journey to find the ideal place for its offspring, once mated, to survive. It has no mouth for eating and absorbs oxygen through the orange orb-like center, which also is what holds its eggs. The wing-like fins help with mobility. Once it finds the ideal hatching grounds for its eggs, it will lay on the ground and absorb its fins and tails into the eggs for proper nutrients to supply its offspring. Finally, once it dies, it decomposes and leaves a huge cone-shaped shell on the ocean floor, which acts as a shelter for the eggs and offspring, so it will ensure they hatch healthily and strong. This does not secure their survival entirely, as out of hundreds, many do not end up surviving. These creatures will be dubbed Mare Parasitusa, or Sea Parasite. This next parasite's early stages of life are similar to that of their ancestors. However, when it enters its host body, it will leave the host via their mouth and enter a specific section of the host's body that is specifically designed to care for and hold these parasites. Once inside, they continue to grow. After some time, their limbs start to form, so they push them out through the surface of the pods and use them to assist in the host's maneuverability. This benefits both the parasite and host, therefore no longer deeming it as a parasite. Rather, now it cooperates with its host, earning the name Cooperante Parasitusa, or Cooperation Parasite. Another descendant of the lovely sea parasite has taken on a different kind of reproduction in comparison to their ancestors. Old adult members of the clade will travel into shallower water an environment they aren't naturally suited to survive in. They will attempt to find a vermis that dwells in aquatic sediment within 24 hour time period. If they are unsuccessful and don't find a vermis, then the pressure difference in the shallow waters compared to the open ocean will kill them. However, if they do find a vermis, they will grapple onto the unfortunate victim and will break through the hard exoskeleton using a hard beak-like structure depositing its eggs into the poor vermis. After this is done, the adult individual will die. The vermis victim will carry the eggs, acting normally until the point of the eggs hatching. The young parasites will burst out of the back using its sharp tipped heads, immediately killing the host. They will then move into deeper waters, living the rest of their lives like that of earth jellyfish. Their primary diet is plankton, and small piscis that are captured in their tendrils. They reach sexual maturity after about five years, entering a mass mating season where multiple different groups of them will gather and reproduce. Males promptly die after completing their life's mission, and the females will travel into more shallower waters to complete the cycle. These clades are some of the largest in terms of diversity during Curious Cambrian explosion, filling ecological niches similar to that of Earth arthropods and insects. However, none of this would have been possible without Kira's dominant plants, which we will cover in the final installment of Kira 30's Cambrian Explosion. This video also wouldn't have been possible without the people who contributed to this project, Harry Knight and Blue Basil. Thank you to you, the viewer. Y'all's support means a lot. And if you'd like to help further the project, a link to the Discord is in the description. Talents of all kind are welcome. If you wish to see how the Vermissa compete against the crawlers, we are hosting a diversification event for one of the four major continents of Kira, which will see the evolution of the first true flyers. Hope to see you there. Master Taxonomist White Glove out.
Thank you.